Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Cheryl Bascom, Vice President of Alumni Relations and Co-Chair of the 250th Anniversary, along with my esteemed colleague, Professor Donald Pease. We're thrilled today to bring you the Dartmouth College Case Symposium. It's a very stimulating program for today and tomorrow to commemorate the 200th anniversary of this landmark event in American jurisprudence. The panel discussions and presentations include some of the best and most renowned legal in the country. The re-argument of the case by Neil Katyal and Greg Garr bring together a former Solicitor General and a former Acting Solicitor General, both Dartmouth alumni, both with impressive experience before the Supreme Court. This is Dartmouth's case, Dartmouth's event. This is the gold standard. These heavy hitters, these great minds are all Dartmouth. From the distinguished judges who'll hear this evening's argument, to the panelists, professors, and scholars, this group reflects the depth of Dartmouth alumni accomplishment, something that's reflected in all of the 250th academic programming throughout the year. Our Sester Centennial programs reflect the diversity and talent of Dartmouth faculty, students, staff, and alumni. We're proud of our participants and enormously grateful to each of them. This afternoon, we'll be opening with a panel of venerable jurists and professors who provide Dartmouth's perspective on the history of the case. We'll close with the re-argument in Alumni Hall and a reception at the top of the hop. We expect a full house, so don't dilly-dally on your way there. Although we celebrate and commemorate our history today, we do so in an effort to inspire our future, to understand how we, as Dartmouth family, can continue to have an outsized impact on our world. There are two ways we can all have an impact on our world and shape the future of Dartmouth. One, through the call to lead, our comprehensive campaign, and two, the call to serve, an effort where Dartmouth alumni, students, faculty, staff, parents, and community can all do service in the name of Dartmouth. In this, our 250th year, the call to lead campaign is going to be financing 250 financial aid scholarships in one year, 250. That's both aspirational and wonderful. The call to serve is hoping to inspire 250,000 hours of service around the world. 250,000 hours, again, aspirational and wonderful. You can learn more about both of these initiatives on the 250th website 250.dartmouth.edu. And for the call to serve, just let me remind you that pro bono work counts. <laughs> now, I'd like to introduce one of the real drivers of bringing the Dartmouth College case to life during our 250th anniversary, Justice James Bassett, class of 78. Jim has worked tirelessly to make sure the event, both here and in the Supreme Court in Washington, really shone. Over the course of Jim's almost 40 years in the law, he served as a law clerk for Chief Judge Andrew A. Caffrey of the Federal District Court in Boston, as an associate at Hale and Door, now Wilmer Hale, before moving with his wife, Ellen, to Canterbury, New Hampshire, where he joined the Concord law firm Orr in Reno. His practice focused on medical malpractice defense, right to know, and First Amendment litigation. And he argued a landmark case decided by the New Hampshire Supreme Court securing the right of the media to bring cameras into, the, into trial courts in New Hampshire. It's a little foreshadowing there. He'd had an active appellate practice, often arguing before the New Hampshire Supreme Court and the United States Courts of Appeal for the First Circuit. He was appointed to the New Hampshire Supreme Court as its 107th Associate Justice in 2012. Since 2016, Justice Bassett has served by appointment of the Chief Justice as a member of the Federal Advisory Committee on the Rules of Evidence. Prior to joining the court, Justice Bassett served for almost 20 years as an elected member of town government in Canterbury and was a board member of numerous nonprofit organizations. He has three adult children and one granddaughter. Please join me in thanking 
and welcoming Jim Bassett. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Bassett, class of 78, and I'm the chairman of the planning committee for the bicentennial of the Dartmouth College case. I want to welcome you here today. Two years ago, I was asked by the co-chairs of Dartmouth Sester Centennial Celebration, Professor Don Pease, and at that time, Martha Beatty, Vice President of Alumni Relations, to come up with a fitting commemoration for the bicentennial of the US Supreme Court decision and trustees of Dartmouth College versus Woodward, as it is more commonly known, the Dartmouth College case. Well, after two years of planning, uh, uh, here we are today, and we were also in Washington uh, one month ago. I would like to uh, thank uh, Don and Cheryl and Marcia and also uh, several other people, John Graby, Kate Stith Cabrenas, and Ernie Young, all of whom are constitutional law professors that you'll meet over the next few days who have worked with me to put together this symposium. And my thanks to all the judges, lawyers, professors, scholars, and undergraduates who will be participating in this symposium. During the past two years, uh, working with all of these people, I have had the opportunity to uh, spend a lot of time on things that I hold dear. The Dartmouth case, constitutional law, Daniel Webster, and New Hampshire history. In addition, I have gotten to know an extraordinary group of accomplished alumni. I've also learned several words that I didn't know before, including Sester Centennial, um, which is a fancy word for 250th anniversary, and illimocenary, which is a fancy word for charitable, which you'll hear several times over the weekend. I still am not sure how to pronounce them or to spell them, but there you go. As you know, this event in Hanover is really part two of our celebration of the Dartmouth case. On January 31st, the case was re-argued in Washington, D.C. at the United States Supreme Court by Neil Katyal and Greg Gare, who will again be here today. I had the privilege of sitting on the bench with Chief Justice John Roberts, joined by Justice Ann Patterson of the, New of the New Jersey Supreme Court, and Judge Jeffrey Sutton of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals to hear the oral arguments. A quick, well, excuse me, a quick word about um, uh, that re-argument at the uh, uh, end of the case, uh, Ju Chief Justice Roberts quite appropriately recognized Neil and Greg as two of the best oral advocates that appear before the Supreme Court, and it's our good fortune that they'll both be here again today. I expect that Greg is hoping for a different result here in Hanover, <clears throat> but he probably shouldn't get his hopes up because we've really stacked the deck here with six judges who are alumni. If we ruled against the college, what would become of the Dartmouth diplomas that we display with pride in our offices? A quick word about Neil Katyal. Between his role as the chair of appellate practice at Hogan Lovells, appearing on Meet the Press and CNN, either on the set or recently, I think, on, from vacation from, uh, from Hawaii, uh, and he has an incredibly robust Twitter account, it makes you wonder if he ever sleeps. In fact, last night when I was going to sleep, Neil was on MSNBC. And, and lest I forget, Neil argued a case on Wednesday at the United States Supreme Court, perhaps the most significant First Amendment case of this term. <clears throat> and Greg will be arguing a case before the Supreme Court next month. Both Neil and Greg clearly have more bandwidth than I do. <clears throat> Uh, clearly, Dartmouth alumni have had and continue to have a huge impact on the law in the United States and in the legal community throughout the country. And the Dartmouth case itself is important not only to the existence of the college, but also to the country. The Marshall Court's decision in 1819 that a corporate charter constitutes a contract within, within the meaning of the contract clause in the U.S. Constitution pre proved to be of immense significance in the subsequent economic development of the United States. Barring state impairment of vested contractual rights would prove critical to our nation's development 
with lasting impact on private education and on the industrial development of our country in the 19th century. 200 years later, it's easy to take for granted the Marshall Court, that the Marshall Court would rule in Dartmouth's favor and that Daniel Webster's arguments per, would prevail. But as you will come to appreciate, it was not a slam dunk case. Without Daniel Webster's legal victory, there would simply be no Dartmouth College. A different outcome would have meant so much more than a different name for this institution, a place that has meant so much to, to Daniel Webster and continues to mean so much to all of us in the Dartmouth family. Now it's my privilege to introduce Professor Don Pease, who's co-chair of the Sestra Centennial. I first met Professor Pease in the summer of 1976, when as a sophomore in taking full advantage of a liberal arts education, I took a course entitled Science Fiction from Don Pease and Noel Perrin. <clears throat> the uh, main attribute of that course that I remember was that the books were small and they could fit well in your hand while you were floating down the river in an inner tube. <laughs> <clears throat> so I was exposed early to Don's brilliance and his eloquence. I learned a lot, but there was one lesson that I should have learned, but I clearly did not, which is never set yourself up to speak before Don Pease, <laughs> because you will suffer mightily in comparison, yet I am resigned to that fate. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you co-chair of the Dartmouth Sestra Centennial, or the 250th, Don Pease. It's a great honor to set the stage for this historic occasion. And let me begin that task by asking you to give Justice Bassett a real Dartmouth welcome for everything that he's done for this event. He said he went to sleep when he turned on MSNBC. I can understand on some occasions why, but he kept the rest of us awake as early as three in the morning when he would send emails asking about different details of the event. I was eager to learn from each of those emails because Justice Bassett suggested that we turn the 200th anniversary of the Dartmouth College case into the foundation stone for the 250th celebration. The rubric for the celebration is honoring the past, inspiring the future. Dartmouth would have had a very different future from the one we presently occupy had that event not taken place in 1819. The Dartmouth College case also became the rubric for every one of the faculty events that were to follow. Conversation with Justice Bassett, Martha Beatty, John Greeby, we decided to turn the faculty and student aspect of the 250th into a rubric that would borrow DNA elements from the celebration of the Dartmouth College case. We have Dartmouth College courses, the one I was honored to teach with Russ Muirhead, who's chair of the government department and one of the most inspiring teachers I've had the honor to teach with. Bob Bonner, chair of the history department, who brings a perspective on the Dartmouth College case and on the thinking through of 19th century history that has added thickness to this literature professor's understanding of the period. The Dartmouth College case also, by the way, constitutes the rationale for every Dartmouth alum when a Dartmouth alum hears the phrase Dartmouth University to shiver with revulsion. <laughs> and well, you should because the name Dartmouth University was a name imposed on Dartmouth College when the New Hampshire State Legislature took our charter and seal 
and records and renamed the college Dartmouth University. The Dartmouth College case is also important for another major reason. Prior to the Dartmouth College case, Dartmouth College understood itself as a colonial church college in which the pulpit constituted the primary site for education. Following Daniel Webster's argument in the Dartmouth College case, the pulpit was replaced by the podium and the courtroom became the site for the deepest instruction. The relationship between a lawyer and a judge in the 19th century, when terms that were still as mysterious as were the words union and liberty were transposed into not merely legal fictions, but principles that constituted not only the deepest understanding of the American experiment, but the interiority of every American citizen. In the 50-year timelines from the Dartmouth College case, 1819, 1869, 1919, 1969, 2019, the Dartmouth College case has become the occasion for the college to quite literally refound itself, according to the logic of honoring the past, inspiring the future. When the centennial celebration of Daniel Webster's graduation from Dartmouth, the then president of Dartmouth, William Jewett Tucker referred back to the case and Daniel Webster. He said, this institution bears the imprint of that man, Webster, and its aspirations for its greatest achievement in here's in our continued understanding of that man's legacy. He also said that uh, Daniel Webster was the only lawyer he knew of who could have a case go on that long <laughs> and expect to receive compensation from the client. <laughs> the Dartmouth College case has also become then the basis for this day, day's event. I teach American drama. I no longer teach science fiction. Uh, the books disappeared in the, in the water upon which uh, Justice Bassett floated. But let me say that this event will be organized today around three acts. There will be discussion of the past, honoring the past, it consists of two professors taught Daniel Webster in the Dartmouth College case and two distinguished alums who are going to discuss those 50-year exponential changes in Dartmouth's history. Second act will be a moot court in which students from Daniel Webster and the Dartmouth College case will present papers that they've written in that course. And as with the moot court structure, they'll be interrogated by Dartmouth law professors who will ask them questions who might make them change their minds about becoming lawyers. <laughs> and that will culminate then in the third act in the great event. The first time in history in which the Dartmouth College case that brought Dartmouth's case to the world will move from its centrifugal trajectory to its centripetal. It'll come home to Dartmouth for the first time, and you will be the beneficiaries. To keep the suspense in play, I noticed that uh, Justice Bassett didn't identify himself 
as Chief Justice or Associate Chief Justice for the New Hampshire Court, which came up with a very different decision. We'll find out in the third act whether his greater loyalties are to Dartmouth or to the state of New Hampshire. <laughs> that said, let me ask Bob Bonner, Chair of the History Department, to introduce this session for real. Welcome, Bob Bonner. I think since this is a panel, I'm going to just uh, be here. I'm going to moderate uh, as, we, as we go and really facilitate the conversation among the four of us. Uh, that really is, is my goal in talking about the history of Dartmouth's perspective on the Dartmouth College case. Uh, the only thing worse than going before dawn is coming after dawn. <laughs> so, Jim, you, you, you got the, the long end of the stick on this one, I suppose. Um, I'd like to just frame um, what we're trying to accomplish here, and why. Uh, why do we start the uh, two days of events with a look backwards on how the case and the history of the college has been uh, commemorated over time? And conveniently enough, it has occupied this sort of every 50 years cycle that makes the 250th uh, such an auspicious time to do this once uh, again. This is 2019, so in some ways, uh, Looking back at legacies, following the formula of the 250th of honoring the past, but also seeking inspiration for the future, is fraught, particularly among colleges. This, there's, a, there's a long list in which institutional heroes have uh, propelled difficult dis discussions. Princeton and uh, the segregationist policies of Woodrow Wilson, Thomas Jefferson and University of Virginia, the money that was earned through the slave trade and the founding of Brown, the naming of Amherst College after a figure in British military history that almost no historian has much good to say about anymore. <laughs> this is the backdrop, I think, for the kinds of, of thoughts that uh, our students have been taking up the kinds of issues that we've been wrestling with. Daniel Webster uh, is not a founder of a college, but he is a re-founder of, of a college. The ways in which we've approached him as a figure that has a fraught history is of our moment. Thank you. To the extent that this has not come about by the kinds of controversies that these other institutions are mired in is, I think, worth noting. The ways in which we can validate, I think, Webster's place in the history of the institution, in the history of the country, in the history of the court, bears some, I think, larger context. We're not going to, I don't, I don't think we're going to say a lot more uh, along those lines as we really dive deep here in the next half an hour and 40 minutes or so that we're going to be moving through thinking about uh, the college not as it was um, shaped by an inspiring leader uh, or a namesake, as is the case of those analogs that I just laid out, uh, not even someone who would go on to serve a governance function on the board of trustees. <coughs> not Daniel Webster's destiny, that was not part of his long resume. But he was, in a very real sense, a re-founder of the college. I think the two things that I would like to frame in terms of putting Daniel Webster and the case side by side, and then invite, uh, in sort of a sequential order, my fellow panelists to weigh in here, is the distinctiveness of 1819 in two respects. Of course, as we will learn throughout the course of this weekend, it was distinctive in the holding of John Marshall, the Chief Justice, in terms of defining a corporation, and also furthermore, listing the ways in which the contract clause could preserve the sanctity of corporate rights. That's a, that's a, that's a key legacy of 1819. I think what we're gonna be working through here, though, is the way in which the words of Daniel Webster 
resonated and continue to resonate in the identity of the institution. Many of you know the peroration. Many of you probably can say it by heart. Everyone knows the key lines. But the way in which, in 1819, a small college worthy of love, a college that Webster presented as weak, vulnerable, a lesser light of the literary establishment, deserved protection, deserved love, deserved someone as an alumnus who would play the role of protecting it as if Caesar was being stabbed. <laughs> In the, in the very famous closing argument that Webster made. That's where we're going to be taking ourselves uh, with the panel today. Uh, the first line of uh, inquiry here, and again, the, the, the objective here is to lay out the different ways in which uh, the, the case has been commemorated and the ways in which Webster has been commemorated uh, is uh, Kate Stith Cabranes. Uh, she was an economics major from the class of 1973, and she graduated at the very top of her class, uh, a distinction that launched her career that took her to Harvard Law School, Harvard Kennedy School, a clerkship with Justice White, and then a position that she now holds at the Yale Law School. Along the way, uh, she's been intricately involved and intimately involved with uh, the Dartmouth community, uh, most notably, I suppose, in terms of her service on the Board of Trustees from 1989 to 2000. What she'll help us to do uh, through an autobiographical lens, we're, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to track the, the, the most recent ways in which this event of 1819 and this figure of Daniel Webster has been commemorated. And we're going to work backwards in time. So we're going to sort of go in reverse here. She's going to offer a an autobiographical perspective on a series of events uh, beginning in 1968-69, uh, going through 1989, going up to 1994. Without further ado, let me draw upon her uh, to share that with us. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, we've been celebrating this every 50 years and sometimes in increments of 25 years as well. Uh, Jim's going to talk about the Chief Justice coming to Dartmouth College in 1869 um, and another Chief Justice coming in 1901. And I'll pick it up in uh, 1968. In 1968, distinguished Judge Henry Friendly of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit delivered a series of lectures at Dartmouth um, on the sesquicentennial which is 150 years, sesquicentennial, of Daniel Webster's argument uh, in the Dartmouth College case. <clears throat> These were nationally significant lectures. They were the only Holmes-devised lectures given uh, at, at Dartmouth. Holmes-devised lectures are given uh, infrequently. They explored the case's uh, protection of the charters of private corporations and connected this to later development in constitutional law. Uh, and that volume was published uh, the next year. <clears throat> that next year, 1969, was uh, the celebration of the sesquicentennial of the decision in the Dartmouth College case. Uh, the president was John Dickey, uh, and the judge who arranged the commemoration in Washington, D.C. was Carl McGowan, uh, a Dartmouth College graduate of the class of 1932, uh, <clears throat> and a judge on the D.C. Circuit. Uh, I later had the good fortune of uh, clerking for him, and I know my Dartmouth pedigree was important because he told me that he had seen mention there was somebody at Harvard Law School who had gone to Dartmouth College, and she was female, and his daughter wanted to go to Dartmouth College, and so he thought he better meet me. That was great. <laughs> um, although the commemoration was of the decision, uh, the keynote speaker, Chief Justice Earl Warren in Washington, focused primarily on Daniel Webster. He noted Webster's representation of federal as opposed to state interests, uh, his big cases. He also noted that he was um, appointed uh, during the prime of his career in pro bono cases, we would call them today, including one case representing 50 unfortunate men who were convicted of piracy, and uh, Webster lost that case in the Supreme Court. Uh, Warren was especially interested in Webster as a legislator eight years in Congress, in the, the House of Representatives, 16 years in the US Senate. He introduced 
uh, bills to implement the federal bankruptcy power, which well, were unsuccessful. He introduced bills to increase the Supreme Court's jurisdictions over what we call federal questions, which is the meat of what the court does today. It was unsuccessful. Webster was really ahead of his time. Um, and, but War understand, this is 1969. Chief Justice Earl Warren himself is under fire, being threatened by the social media of the day with impeachment. Impeach Earl Warren signs out in Missouri where I was growing up. <clears throat> and so he saved his biggest cheer for Webster's fierce uh, support for the independence of the federal judiciary. And he quoted a Webster's statement from the floor of the Senate. The maintenance of federal judicial power is essential and indispensable to the very being of government. Uh, the Constitution without it would be no Constitution. <clears throat> uh, 20 years later, in 1989, uh, we're back at Dartmouth. And we have another Chief Justice. This is Chief Justice William H. Rehnquist, who had been invited by Dartmouth's relatively new president, James O. Friedman, to come celebrate the completion of Dartmouth's archive of Webster's papers, 1989. Uh, perhaps improbable friends, but close friends. They had met uh, at a seminar on American history uh, many years before. <clears throat> um, like Chief Justice Warren in 69, Chief Justice Rehnquist in 1989 spoke mostly about Webster, as was appropriate. Uh, as, and his oratorical skills as displayed not only in the Supreme Court, but in places where many more people saw him, such as the dedication of the Bunker Hill Monument, uh, his presentation at the bicentennial celebration of the Pilgrims landing at Plymouth Rock, and he focused particularly on Webster's famous reply to South Carolina Senator Robert Hayne when they were both in the Senate. This was a three-day uh, set of arguments between Senator Hayne and Senator Webster. <clears throat> Hayne was arguing that states had the right to nullify federal law. Uh, it's been called the greatest debate in the history of the Senate. Uh, <clears throat> And Webster's peroration in that case is also justly famous. It includes the lines, and this was quoted by Chief Justice uh, Rehnquist, when mine eyes shall turn to behold for the last time the sun in heaven, may I not see that sun shining down on broken and dishonored fragments of a once glorious union. Let my eyes last feeble glance behold the glorious ensign of this republic. And then, liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. That speech was transcribed, uh, and thousands of copies were printed and distributed throughout the, throughout the country. Uh, finally, let me mention what we did in 1994. We were back in Washington. It, we're celebrating the 175th anniversary. And uh, we thought it'd be really cool to have a Supreme Court justice. Um, the chief couldn't do it. it, it the time, and uh, uh, fortunately, we had a person organizing the event <clears throat> named Jack Bennett of the class of 66, who thought to call the secretaries of the justices of the Supreme Court until he found one who was interested. And he called Justice Blackman's secretary, and she said, well, you know, he feels very warmly about Dartmouth College. Uh, and so Justice Blackman presided over a brief re- enactment uh, or reconstruction of the argument, which we held in the old Supreme Court chamber under the Senate, which is where the original case had been announced uh, 175 years before. Um, <clears throat> and uh, why did Justice Blackman feel this warmth for Dartmouth College? For one thing, John Dickey had been his law school classmate at Harvard. And secondly, uh, David McLaughlin, as president, bestowed an honorary degree on Justice Blackman in 1985, uh, just nine years before this event. Uh, in fact, Jim Friedman deferred to David McLaughlin, um, and who, who spoke at the event. I also spoke there. I got to deliver Webster's peroration. It sounds really good in female voice, too. Uh, and I'll, I'll spare you 95% of what I said in my address that day. Uh, 
But I want to say one quote, one part of it, or paraphrase one part of it, because I'm not sure it's otherwise going to be covered. Here's what I said. The form of regulation that New Hampshire sought to assert over Dartmouth was no more than the Connecticut legislature had asserted over Yale in 1792, when it increased the size of the Yale Corporation from 11 to 19, with the eight new members all being state officials. And just four years before New Hampshire tried to establish Dartmouth University, Massachusetts had altered the composition of Harvard's Board of Overseers to include uh, a significant number of minutes of the state Senate, even though the Board of Overseers had voted not to increase its size. Um, so in its time, New Hampshire's efforts to reorganize Dartmouth were arguably within a developed tradition of intermingling private and public responsibilities in higher education. But there's a difference. Yale and Harvard acquiesced. Dartmouth's trustees resisted, sued, and won. There's a lesson to be learned here. Uh, the ultimate responsibility for preserving the autonomy of our great independent educational institutions rests exactly where their founders placed such responsibility. As in 1816, when the Octagon trustees sued, uh, the independence of our great educational institutions rests with the trustees of those institutions. Thank you. So as moderator, I'd like to not get too close to that, but as moderator, I would like to just follow up and also uh, uh, direct the conversation slightly before we, we move to the, the next series of anniversaries uh, to put on the table here. And, and one of these is um, really to draw attention here um, and then invite some comment from my panelists um, on what also happened in 1989, which was the completion uh, of the papers of, of uh, Daniel Webster, uh, which was a multi-year, really very important um, uh, undertaking. Uh, it was uh, begun by uh, a Dartmouth historian by the name of Charles Wiltsey, but of course it was brought to completion by um, Jerry Danielle, uh, I'm sorry, by Ken Shoemaker, who along with Jerry Danielle, in our department, the Dartmouth History Department, really represented a very special uh, treasure in terms of the history of this institution. Uh, Jerry is an alum, uh, Ken Shoemaker as the editor of the uh, papers of Daniel Webster, um, really uh, are, are kind of irreplaceable in terms of institutional memory for Dartmouth. Uh, in, in, in that regard, it's particularly sad that as we were planning this event, we really had hoped to include uh, Ken in particular. Uh, although as many of you know, he passed away in the fall, uh, but it was the completion of that really, the, 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 the life's work of the Daniel Webster papers that was the occasion for uh, Chief Justice Winquist uh, coming to Hanover. Um, those of you who know uh, Ken and knew Ken for longer than I do uh, can sort of sum it up, uh, the, uh, the, the ways in which um, his contributions to our understanding of uh, the man matter. Ken was a historian of American foreign relations, and so in some respects, I always think of Daniel Webster as much as a diplomat as he is a, as a senator or uh, as, a, as, a, as a, a lawyer. Um, anyway, I, I did want to acknowledge um, his, his role in the, the, the broader uh, institutional commitment to Daniel Webster's legacy. I'd like to uh, include uh, Jim now, um, and uh, the introduction that uh, that was already given uh, to Jim uh, did draw attention to uh, the fact that he was the uh, 107th uh, member of the Supreme Court. He's the kind of person that I think might even know how many Dartmouth grads among the 106 <laughs> there were. Um, one, one of the things about uh, the New Hampshire court is that it's, it's littered with Dartmouth grads, I'm quite sure. We, we would be able to provide that number with a, with a little bit of digging, I think. We have two right now. <laughs> 
And the other thing I'd like to just sort of underscore, uh, the extent to which he is now serving on the, on the Judicial Conference Advisory Committee, his uh, special purview here is, is on the nature of evidence in the legal sense, but in terms of the way in which he has accumulated the evidence of the way this, this, this case has been commemorated, uh, it's really, truly extraordinary. Um, what I'd like to do is to uh, have Jim either play the autobiographical role and uh, expand upon some of the, uh, the, the issues that Kate did, or to get us right into the historical moment. His assignment for today was to, to think a little bit about the um, event that marked the centennial of Daniel Webster's graduation from Dartmouth, which was in uh, 1901. He was the class of 1801, and that was the, the laying of the cornerstone of uh, Webster Hall, now Rauner Library. So let me hand it over to Jim. He can either continue some of the, the things that Kate has said about the, the late 20th century commemorations or take us way back uh, to 1901. Thanks, Bob. Uh, unlike the academics here at the table, I'm much better at asking questions than just speaking, um, but that's not my role right now. So, uh, But I've been waiting probably 45 years to have Bob ask this question because I have a book here that is entitled The Proceedings of the Webster Centennial of Dartmouth College. And I bought this in the discard bin in the O2 room back in 1975 for 35 cents. <laughs> and my mother, who's here today, uh, was quite chagrined when I would bring these books home. And uh, I always told her that, you know, someday this would come in handy. And I, uh, <laughs> so that was really the impetus for uh, having this uh, bicentennial celebration of the <laughs> Dartmouth case. Her. Yeah, right. <clears throat> uh, so uh, actually this book is quite amazing and uh, I did read it at the time and then it has been on my shelf for many years. I would just say um, even before I got to the New Hampshire Supreme Court I was interested in uh, Webster and in my office back in my law firm I had a, uh, an etching of Daniel Webster that I think had belonged to uh, Dudley Orr. Some of you might remember him. He was uh, on the Board of Trustees here at Dartmouth in the uh, 60s and 70s, and the namesake of the law firm that I was at, and I think he was one of the major forces behind co-education as well. And uh, he, he had that uh, etching. I wound up with it in my office at Orr and Reno, so I've had this very large etching of Daniel Webster, which many of my colleagues thought was very weird that I had that for so long. And then I uh, actually brought it to the court with me when I came to the court. Um, and uh, we hear oral arguments several times a month and we sit in a courtroom with about 30 portraits of uh, chief justices adorning the walls of our courtroom. And uh, I know that each one of those people has uh, history behind them. And over time, I came to appreciate who some of them were. And the one that uh, was immediately to my left as I sat on the court for many years was um, Jeremiah Smith, who actually uh, I came to learn about. And as I learned about the Dartmouth College case, I came to realize he was the Chief Justice of the New Hampshire Supreme Court in the early uh, 1800s. He was a Federalist, and the Federalist Jeffersonian tug of war plays into the Dartmouth College case in a significant way. Um, but uh, uh, Smith was the Chief Justice of our court in the early 1800s, and he became governor. And then he came back to being uh, Chief Justice of our court between 1813 and 1816. In 1816, the uh, Jeffersonian Republicans took over New Hampshire. They took over the legislature. Governor Plummer won as uh, governor of New Hampshire. And his two main platform planks when he ran were uh, to take over Dartmouth College and turn it into a public university and throw out all the Federalist judges. And uh, he... Uh, 
in the 1816 version of Promises Made, Promises Kept, he did that, and uh, he passed the laws that came to give rise to the Dartmouth College case, and he threw out the judges. And uh, Dartmouth, I think, uh, wanted to harness the energy of that event and hired Jeremiah Smith. He was the first lawyer that Dartmouth hired to uh, represent it in the uh, Dartmouth College case. He brought in another lawyer, uh, Jeremiah Mason, and the two of them are really the architects of the legal theory that, was a, that uh, ultimately prevailed in the Dartmouth College case with uh, Daniel Webster being brought in for the second day of arguments before our court, the New Hampshire <laughs> Superior Court at the time, and uh, then at the U.S. Supreme Court. But both of those gentlemen, um, uh, Chief Justice Smith and uh, Jeremiah Mason, have portraits on the wall of our court and there's also a portrait of uh, Chief Justice Richardson, who was the Chief Justice who was put on our court in 1816 and was the Chief Justice deciding the case. So in any event, that was the background that I was acquiring when I was at the court. I had this book, and I came to read it. And I would just say um, it's quite extraordinary because uh, many of the people that were, the Webster Centennial was in September of 1901, and it was the uh, event uh, where they laid the cornerstone of Webster Hall, which is now the Rauner Library. It's both, I guess, yes. It's still Rauner Webster Library Hall. in Webster yes, Hall. Yes, okay. And, um, and so uh, it, that was one of the major events there. Um, but one of the amazing things as I read this is that this was really the last event where um, there were people who had seen Webster speak who spoke at that event, and one of the, the major uh, uh, purposes of the event, and this was uh, an event held in the uh, chapel that day, um, a gentleman spoke and said, there are not many of us left now that can remember having seen Mr. Webster in his prime. And if the lips, which must soon be closed in that silence with, which knows no breaking, do not now speak, it will not be possible for those who are younger to hear anything which shall come direct from men who knew the man in whose honor we meet today. So much of this volume is actually filled with people who heard Webster speak, either here at Dartmouth or uh, one of the uh, major uh, speeches here was about by a uh, young man who attended the um, speech at Bunker Hill, uh, where Webster spoke at the dedication of the monument with 50,000 people present. The other thing that I find notable in this celebration, uh, other than I do actually have the uh, invitation card as well, that was a special bonus with my purchase. Um, <laughs> to attend the event, and uh, it said there will be a grand illumination, a torchlight parade, speaking and singing in the college yard, a bonfire and fireworks. So we're coming up a little short. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and then they also mentioned that the, Chief Justice, of the uh, Chief Justice of the United States was going to speak. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, Chief Justice uh, Melville Weston Fuller spoke at the uh, dedication event. He had, uh, both of his grandfathers had gone to Dartmouth uh, with Daniel Webster. One of them was a very close friend of Daniel Webster. And uh, Chief Justice Fuller had been a law student at Harvard Law School in 1852 and he was given the day off to attend uh, Webster's funeral in Marshfield, Massachusetts. And actually, there are four or five <laughs> people that spoke at this event who were present that day. And it's, a real, it's an incredible connection, obviously one that we uh, can't have now, but these people who heard him speak and saw him and felt his presence. So it's... Uh, it's an amazing book. I assume if they discarded it, there are several other volumes of this uh, <laughs> over in Baker, and I would encourage uh, all of you to read it. I, if we had time, I would read you some of it, but we probably don't. So 
that's the background that I bring to it. It's, uh, uh, for me, uh, being on the court and uh, um, having Webster had an active career in the, in the New Hampshire uh, legal community before he went to Massachusetts makes this all particularly special for me. Let me let me just follow up as you as you have uh, considered the the Webster centennial. Is there a sense in which uh, the case itself was figured uh, in a way to? Uh, I mean, the way that we've been approaching it in our classes, it sort of launched the la it relaunched the college and launched the public man. Uh, how much of the how much of the Webster centennial had to do with the case, if, it, if any? Uh, surprisingly little. I mean, mm -hmm. they really focused on the personal interactions with Webster, though there were a lot of uh, lot of judges that spoke, and um, and there was one particular uh, long disquisition on uh, on the importance of the case at that time. I don't. At that time, it was one of the most off-cited cases by the uh, Supreme Court. The um, cited with less frequency now, though it still does appear periodically in uh, U.S. Supreme Court cases. Um, but the, the focus was, this wasn't so much a legal uh, uh, analysis as it was a celebration of Webster. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot in here about his oratory, oratory skills and uh, just how he presented himself. So as we're going backwards in time here, we, we should acknowledge uh, uh, that Chief Justice Roberts is only the latest in a line of uh, ju judicial figures from the Supreme Court who have helped to mark this as, uh, as a landmark within the, the history of constitutional law. So we have, we have Roberts, we have Blackman, we have Rehnquist, uh, we go back to Fuller. Uh, this goes back one step farther. And we will acknowledge here a anniversary that did line up. The 1901 was around the 150th, I'm sorry, the 100th anniversary of the case within, you know, a decade and a half. <laughs> uh, exactly, exactly. But the, uh, the, the, the next Supreme Court justice that we'd like to linger on uh, briefly uh, was in 1869. And that was the moment in which the college celebrated its centennial, and among those who were uh, part of those festivities was uh, Salmon P. Chase. In terms of the, the way in which uh, that centered, I've done a little bit of looking into this, not quite as, as, as extensively as Jim has with the 1901, uh, but it was quite interesting to see Salmon P. Chase, who was the sitting um, Supreme Court Justice, travel to, and pay tribute to the college, but really sort of handed over uh, the person who gave the, the key historical address on the centennial, it's really the first sort of history of the college, uh, was the son of uh, a guy by the name of uh, Samuel Brown, who was the uh, son of the president of the college in the midst of the case. His tribute to Webster, and this is, I think, quite interesting, is not that Webster helped save the college, Again, remember this is 1869, but that it's on the basis of his reply to Hayne that they gave that he gave the formula for saving the Union. And that that aspect of Webster's legacy was really brought into focus at the moment of at the moment of the college celebrating its centennial, and I think that's one of the things that we've been circling around in the class uh, that we've been teaching. Webster and Union. Now, the, the last part of this presentation, we've been going back in time. There was, there was no uh, uh, intermediate celebration. I suppose the closest you get is uh, the Dartmouth-sponsored uh, tribute to Webster upon the occasion of his death. This was in 1853. One of the things that happened at that was there was this big, big picture of Webster draped in black, and at the bottom, a placard read, I have to get this right. <laughs> I live still. These were Webster's last words. And as I hand it over to my colleague, Professor Muirhead, Russ Muirhead of the, of the government department, uh, that has sort of been one of the themes of the classes that we've been doing with our, our students. I live still. What about 1819 gave immortality to the institution? What 
did Webster in living the life that he did gain immortality to his legacy, to his, his status as this iconic American figure? Those are sort of some of the things that we've been thinking about in the class. Uh, I'd like to ask Professor Muirhead just to sort of give us uh, a fairly brief overview of, of what it, this commemoration has done, which is, is an innovation, uh, which has been to involve students in doing research upon the occasion of 1819 and its legacy. I noticed that you say fairly brief. Is that as a consequence of having taught with me all term? <laughs> we have six minutes. <laughs> did, you, did you pick that up? Well, if you insist. Buckle up, it could be 55 minutes. That's about what a class takes. I love that, um, that, that, that image from the selection that you just quoted, Justice Bassett, um, where this generation that literally remembers Daniel Webster um, is, is, is dying. And, and, and you know, where with its death, there comes the risk that the memory, that Daniel Webster will no longer be remembered. There'll be, no longer be anyone who experienced his oratory. One of the, one of the first gatherings, Professor Bonner and Professor Pease and myself, uh, I think you asked, you said, well, this is, what does it mean to commemorate? And, you know, we learn many surprising and beautiful things teaching with people of other, from other departments and disciplines. And right away, Professor P said, well, it literally means to remember together. <laughs> to co-memorate, of course. Like, well, what are we, idiots? No, we're just historians and political scientists. <laughs> and, <clears throat> the, and that's what we are doing this afternoon. That's what we're doing tomorrow morning at this symposium. We're, we are remembering together. We're, we have to remember together because we can't any longer remember alone. We weren't there to see Daniel Webster. We don't literally possess the memory. And so to generate it and to harbor it and to, and to as you say, keep it alive, to keep, to keep this example alive, we have to remember it. We remember the example of Daniel Webster and we remember this case that saved our college. The Dartmouth College case is an example of judicial review of the Supreme Court using the clause in the Constitution, was it Article 1, Section 10, to invalidate a state law with majority support. That's exactly the sort of thing that Thomas Jefferson hoped never would happen in American democracy. He did not want constitutions that were venerated and old and ancient and would constrain democratic majorities from doing what they thought it best to do. He wanted constitutions to have an expiration date, to die out with each generation, so that no generation would inherit something that it didn't want and would find itself constrained by that inheritance. A different posture, I think, on the past is not so much to see it as an unwanted inheritance, but to see it as something that we are burdened to understand that we inherit whether we like it or not, that we can't really escape. No inheritance is deserved. No inheritance, good or bad, is deserved. The best we can do is to understand what we have inherited, to appreciate it insofar as it should be appreciated, and in doing that, perhaps to show ourselves worthy of what we don't deserve, what we've inherited. We, the students of Dartmouth College, the past students of Dartmouth College, the teachers here at Dartmouth College, the staff at Dartmouth College have inherited this place. And we don't deserve it. We did nothing to build it or get it or, uh, or, or, or preserve it. We just got it. It's easy to ask things of it. If I saw the provost here, I'd ask him for a parking space. <laughs> it's easy to use it and to make it work for us. And I love seeing Dartmouth students use this place and breathe their life into this place so that it lives. Love seeing it being used. It's easy to do that and turn it to your advantage. It's harder to appreciate it, to understand it, and to walk down these ice-covered paths of the green in a spirit of gratitude for what we have inherited. The path to gratitude begins with remembrance, with remembering. And in our class, the class that Professor Pease and Professor Bonner and I have taught all this term, and here now, today and tomorrow, we are remembering Webster, Webster the lawyer, 
who as a lawyer saved this college as a college, not as a mighty establishment of the state, but as a weak and vulnerable private college with public purposes, who preserved this college as a college, not as a great university, as what would come to be called in the 20th century a knowledge factory, <laughs> but instead as a face-to-face -face community where every student is seen by every teacher, is known by her or his teachers. This college is dedicated to the proposition that you can learn when someone is looking at you in the eye, that learning is transformative, that it's not just a, a, a laundry list of propositions and content that one might memorize and contain like a hard drive on a computer, but that it's a formative enterprise. That's what a college is all about, and that's what Daniel Webster, as a lawyer, saved and refounded. And we remember Daniel Webster as an orator, who as an orator um, inhabited the United States Constitution and transmitted through his speech, as you mentioned, and I'm so glad you mentioned the reply to Hain, because this is where he articulates his repudiation of the dominant understanding of the American Union as a compact of separate sovereign states. That is an error, Daniel Webster argued. It is not a compact of separate sovereign states. The United States Union, as your selection showed, was formed by the individuals of the country. It was made by the people, the sovereign people, not by the sovereign states. And through that speech, he taught Lincoln why secession, why the principle of secession is the principle of anarchy. And he showed Lincoln how to resist it. And we remember Webster as a statesman who sought with everything in him, who, as, Donald, as Professor Pease so unforgettably argued in our class last week, who sacrificed himself, his reputation, and indeed, really, his life for the sake of the Union. The Union in the 1850s, preserving the Union in the 1850s, required obliterating any moral judgment about the status of slavery. And, and in order to defend the Union, I would argue that Daniel Webster in himself obliterated any moral judgment about the status of slavery. And in that great failing, he sought a great political virtue to hold people together in a condition of peace. There was no way he found, no way he could discover to do it, except by paying that moral price. We would say we wouldn't pay that, and maybe we wouldn't. But what we've done in remembering Daniel Webster as a statesman is not apologize for him, but remember him with our eyes open to see, remembering his vices and his virtues, so that we could understand his example and appreciate it and be grateful for it, and through that, perhaps, maybe, become partly worthy of what we have inherited from him, this college and this country. With that, we'll close this session, and we'll get regather in 15 minutes. <laughs>